Drivers proudly brought to you by Primus Telecom and Karcher High Pressure Cleaners. From National 9 News, this is Nightline with Hugh Remington. European markets open sharply down, suggesting new dangers for Australian shareholders. Democrats' leader intervenes from London in the latest party brawl, and are Golden Girls stealing the show in Manchester? Good evening. Also tonight, we farewell Rumpole, tributes for Australian actor Leo McCurr. After holding out bravely for days, the Australian share market finally cracked today. More than $15 billion was wiped off the value of shares as the market fell to its lowest level since the aftermath of September 11. Some called it the dip we had to have. 2.3% wiped off the Australian market by closing time. The All Ordinaries Index down nearly 70 points. Banks, Telstra and News Corp led the southbound slide. Resource stocks and gold are also under pressure. The wash up, the market is now at its lowest point in 10 months, down 12% for the year. There will be jitters for quite, quite some time to come. The bright side is, compared to overseas, we're still doing quite well. The UK market has now lost a quarter of its value this year. Wall Street down by a third. So far, our financial markets have not uh, reacted proportionately to what's occurred in the United States and in Europe. Traders and analysts say there was a sense of inevitability about the drop, described as a delayed response to the US market. No one seems to be calling it a crisis just yet, although the sentiment is it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not very attractive, it's not a lot of fun, but it's not a crisis. As usual, all seems to pivot on the US. Wall Street's summer markdown sale was extended another day. There, corporate accountability is the number one scourge in a market described as a gravity of pessimism. And investors are selling first and asking questions later. One still has to be very concerned about the US. Such is the momentum in the US at the moment that uh, we certainly can't be calling the bottom here. Locally, some experts suggest the best thing for investors to do is sit back, hold on and ride the bumps out. People in good quality companies should be fine. Companies are going to continue to make profits and pay dividends. Well, I think it's going to present some good opportunities if you're a long-term investor, so I'm not really worried at all. Not at all. You know, it's just another day for me. Matthew Watson for Nightline. Few shares escaped a trimming today. AMP lost another 51 cents. ANZ was off 4% to $17.77, falling more heavily than other banks after revealing a loan exposure to the struggling British telco Marconi. Newcrest Mining fell 13%. News Corp was down half a dollar. And Rio Tinto was $1.24 weaker, with half-year earnings tomorrow forecast to show a 17% fall in profits. A few shares did rise. The best performers were Harvey Norman, adding another $0.08. Cents. That's a 6% rise over the last two days. And Qantas was $0.10 cents stronger at 4.62 after confirming talks to buy a quarter share of Air New Zealand. Overseas, Tokyo slipped below 10,000 on the Nikkei for the first time in five months. The index closing 267 points down. London isn't doing any better tonight. It hit a six-year low in early trading this evening. It has recovered slightly, but is still down nearly 122 points on the day so far. Gold is also down more than $2, fetching $311 US an ounce. And the Australian dollar tonight is almost half a cent lower against the greenback, buying 53.65 US cents. It's also down against the other majors. While the rough ride is set to continue for Australian investors, those borrowing money could be in for a reprieve, with interest rates less likely to rise in the near future. New figures show inflation grew by just 0.7% in the June quarter, giving us an annual rate of 2.8%, safely inside the Reserve Bank range. Treasurer Peter Costello believes the figures send a clear signal to the Reserve Bank to leave rates on hold. I don't think uh, you would glean from these figures uh, any undue inflationary pressures in relation to the Australian economy. Uh, no doubt the bank will take uh, these figures into account. And that view is supported by leading independent economist Chris Richardson. Inflation has been a problem in Australia, but this result is a little bit better than expected. It gives the Reserve Bank that little bit of breathing space. Won't stop interest rates in Australia heading up, but they won't be heading up in a rush. The Reserve Bank board next meets in a fortnight. 
Democrats leader Natasha Stott Despoir has tonight told her colleagues to cool it as internal tensions again threaten to tear her party apart, with a leader trying to contain the damage from a new brawl between two of her senators. Deputy Leader Aidan Ridgway says the public has had a gutful of the infighting. The Democrats' problems seem to get worse by the day, with leader Natasha Stott Despoir currently out of the country in the UK. West Australian Senator Andrew Murray was the latest to break ranks and call for a change of direction. The statistics show we've lost our small L liberal support. Now, I think that's bad for us. Uh, I don't think we can be a pale imitation of the Greens. That sparked an angry response from Andrew Bartlett, one of Senator Stott Despoir's strongest supporters, who accused Senator Murray of deliberately trying to damage the party. It's, you know, it's pathetic, it's, it's politically stupid and it's um, you know, disgracefully gutless. There were even suggestions Senator Murray should consider quitting the Democrats. That's been suggested to me by quite a few members that um, he perhaps isn't fully at home in the party. In a statement, Senator Stott Despoir said she was surprised and disappointed by the attacks on the party in the past 24 hours. That could well have been directed at her own deputy, Aidan Ridgway, who sparked the latest hostilities earlier this week when he called for the Democrats to reposition themselves closer to the political centre. I remind my colleague, Senator Stott Despoir said, of the commitment they made not to publicly comment on internal party matters and expect them to refrain from further statements. Senator Ridgway, meantime, has reaffirmed his support for his leader. I think that the members and the public have had a gutful of infighting in the party and I think most of all we ought to put this behind us and that's what I'm calling for. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. HIH, Money and the Collingwood Football Club were back under examination today at the HIH Royal Commission in Sydney. Collingwood Director Brad Cooper says he paid for the failed insurance company's quarter of a million dollar sponsorship of the club, but he denies it was all designed to ensure his re-election to the Magpie Board. It's been a week since the sponsorship deal was first raised at the inquiry, and today the man at the centre of it all was finally called on to explain. In his third day at the Commission, Brad Cooper revealed he'd effectively paid for the Collingwood deal himself by paying a quarter of a million dollars extra for a share deal with HIH, a cheque then made out to the Magpies by the insurer's subsidiary, FAI. That coincided with Mr Cooper facing re-election on the Collingwood board, the Commission's lawyer claiming that was the real reason behind it. And that was done for the purpose of encouraging your electoral prospects, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. It was Why done was to, it done then? It was done to complete their earlier promise. Mr Cooper, whose position on the board was backed by Eddie Maguire, agreed the deal was said to be a reason why he should be re-elected. Mr Maguire said that, didn't he? He may have said that, yes. And you knew he said that? I, I know he said a lot of things. But it wasn't just the Collingwood deal that had Mr Cooper in the hot seat today. He also faced intense questioning about his purchase that same month of a mansion belonging to HIH boss Ray Williams. Transactions reveal more than $1 million was paid into Mr Cooper's personal company account at the time by a company he'd just taken control of, Home Security International, or HSI. Once you acquired control of HSI, you used its money as, its, as your own, didn't you? No, I did not. Days later, Mr Cooper paid a deposit on the luxury home. He denies any impropriety. Nina Stevens reporting for Nightline. Sydney police are hunting a firebug who put at risk 70 elderly residents of a nursing home. The arsonist set fire to a vehicle in a car park beneath the building in the western suburb of Marylands. Many of the residents who were sleeping at the time were overcome by smoke before being rescued. 16 needed treatment in hospital. Some remain tonight under observation. A Melbourne court has been told a woman who allegedly advertised her unborn child for adoption on the internet did not know the practice was illegal. The 39-year-old, who can't be named because of family court proceedings, has pleaded not guilty to agreeing to a $10,000 payment from an American couple for the baby. The first awareness that she could be breaking the law apparently came from her partner when she was eight months pregnant. The American couple is expected to give evidence via video link at a hearing in November. 
Euthanasia campaigner Dr Philip Nitschke says the failed suicide of Victorian woman Sandy Williamson again highlights the need for laws giving people the right to die. My understanding is that no one was with her and she understood that perfectly well. She wisely, because she was careful of not wanting to expose others to risk, had to act alone. Dr Nitschke says he has been in contact with Ms Williamson's family since her suicide attempt yesterday was thwarted when someone tipped off the ambulance service. Queensland's public hospital wards are tonight returning to normal. The state's nurses were today forced to lift work bans imposed over the past seven weeks as part of a pay claim. The Industrial Relations Commission has ruled the dispute must go to arbitration. Australia's athletes continue to drift into Manchester for Friday's opening of the Commonwealth Games. Among them, Cathy Freeman getting a warm welcome and our pin-up pole vaulter, Tatiana Grigorieva. Here in Britain, Tatiana Grigorieva has been labelled the Games Glamour Girl. I'm here to do my job. I'm here to compete and hopefully to win the competitions. Ranked number one at these Games, Tatiana's recent form hasn't been great but she hopes to go one better than her Sydney Olympic silver. I just want to get out on the track, take my pulse and hopefully do the best jumps. For the British press though, it's Tatiana's good looks that have given her the headline. Another headline grabber made her much anticipated arrival in Manchester today. Feeling happy. <laughs> after being swamped by camera crews at the airport, <laughs> Kathy Freeman was whisked away. Good luck, Kathy. Today was clearly the day of our golden girls. Susie O'Neill here, not to swim, but to cheer on our team. It felt sort of quite weird walking through the door and knowing I'm not going to be competing here. It felt a little bit funny. Most of our athletes are here now. Runner Susie Power bringing her biggest fan with her. Our swimmers aren't due for another few days, but almost everyone else is in place, safely installed here at the Athletes' Village their focus on getting ready for competition. In Manchester, Simon Boda reporting for Nightline. Tributes continue to pour in tonight for actor Leo McKern, who died last night aged 82. Best known as Rumpole of the Bailey, the Sydney-born star is being remembered for hundreds of roles on stage and screen. In his life, and it was a long one, he played many parts. I do know the rules, my lord. That he most certainly did of acting and the law, his most famous and enduring character, Rumpole of the Bailey. Leo McKern was almost 60 when Rumpole began in 1978. The tales of the crusty barrister full of compassion and claret continued for 15 years. Audiences worldwide entranced with both the courtroom drama and Rumpole's relationship with she who must be obeyed, his wife. She would help me with the shopping every day. Oh. Really? Although he returned often to his native Sydney, Reginald McKern, he became Leo on arrival in London in 1946, made England his home, seizing ever-increasing offers of roles on the stage. Let him set fire to the parrot. Thank the Lord, it was stuffed. You always felt that if you weren't very good, he might just leap off the stage and have you for breakfast. Then, television and films. Where are you from? Oh, Melbourne. Oh, Melbourne. I had a cousin from Melbourne. Poor fella shot himself. Yes, it can affect you that way. McKern's other co-star, Henry Zepp. He put on a role, and you couldn't see where it stopped and he started. You couldn't see the join at all. Peter Harvey for Nightline. And ahead on Nightline, Frozen in Wax, the new model Kylie at Madame Tussauds. And the Pope perks up on his mission to Canada. This is Nightline. A big day tomorrow for banned Sydney bookmaker Robbie Waterhouse. Racing authorities will deliver their judgment on his appeal against a two-year disqualification. Stewards found Waterhouse guilty of 16 charges after he took bets at extravagant odds on behalf of an associate, Peter McCoy, earlier this year. The New South Wales government will stick with its controversial selective schools system despite a highly critical report. Professor Tony Vincent says only 11 of the state's 28 selective high schools should be kept, the rest downgraded. He claims the system failed some of the bright students it's supposed to help. There is a body of research that says when you concentrate the brightest youngsters together, some will even 
decline in their abilities and most certainly in their academic self-image. Their confidence will decline. The system remains popular with many parents. However, the car government says it is not planning to change it. The spiritual leader of Hamas says his radical Palestinian Islamic group had been ready to declare a truce before Israel launched its bomb raid yesterday in Gaza, which killed 15 people, including his own deputy. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin says the only course now is holy war. Israel has apologized for the civilian casualties, including nine children. Palestinian mourners screamed for revenge on the streets of Gaza as they carried the dead from the Israeli attack to burial sites. Israel called Sheikh Salah Shahadi a most brilliant and brutal terrorist and last night used an F-16 plane to drop a one-ton bomb to kill him. But they also killed 14 other civilians, mostly women and children. For that, the Israelis have apologized. Unfortunately, along with him, died several civilians apparently uh, innocent and we are very sorry for it we didn't hope such for such results the united nations america and the european union criticized israel for the attack that killed so many innocents including this woman's four nieces and nephews and her sister-in-law they were neighbors of the terrorist leader the wall of the building collapsed onto them. the president views this as a heavy-handed action that is not consistent with dedication to peace in the Middle East. The Palestinians' attempt at payback was immediate but unsuccessful. Salam, salam. This morning, the Israelis shot and killed two Hamas terrorists trying to cross no man's land into Israel. Robert Penfold, reporting for Nightline. Pope John Paul is in Canada to lead an international rally of Catholic youth. Despite his chronic health problems, he showed some unexpected spirit when he arrived in Toronto. In a display of vigor not seen for some time, Pope John Paul II walked slowly down the steps of the plane that brought him on the first leg of one of his longest ever pilgrimages. There had been concerns that fading health might curtail activities on his 97th foreign trip, but the 82-year-old Pope seems to draw strength from being among young people. Reading his arrival speech in an unusually strong voice, the Pope set the theme for World Youth Day. Reminding all Christians to be souls of the earth and light of the world. So far, only 200,000 young pilgrims have registered for the five days of religious celebration, far fewer than had been hoped for. Vatican officials attributed the shortfall to fears about terrorism. The trip also comes as the scandal over sexual abuse by priests is spreading from the U.S. to Canada. Nonetheless, young people have arrived from 170 countries, drawn as much by the men as the event, a fact the Canadian Prime Minister noted in his welcoming speech. We have a truly inspiring example of personal commitment. But John Paul II also has arthritis and Parkinson's disease, and for the first time in his 24-year papacy, will take a break before the main event. Britain's love affair with Kylie Minogue shows no signs of ending. For the third time, she's been given the wax treatment by Madame Tussauds. In a pouting pose, the Princess of Pop looks provocative as ever. She's fantastic. She's really similar to the real Kylie. We just walked in, we just looked at the statues, but whoa, they look so the same. The sexy star has become the sauciest attraction at London's famous wax works. She breathes seductively and whispers in your ear. Can't get you out of my head. You just expect to sort of get up off a plinth at any moment and say, good day, or whatever Kylie would say. She's one of pop industry's great survivors, and it's the same story here at Madame Tussauds. This is Kylie's third reincarnation here, putting her in the elite company of the Queen and Margaret Thatcher. Everybody knows who she is. Mm. So I think she's doing it the right way. Keep reinventing yourself and we'll keep making wax figures. Her other two wax models are being consigned to the warehouse as Kylie Mark III joins a collection of famous Aussie exports on display. Damien Ryan reporting for Nightline. After the break, injury hits a league star ahead of top of the table clash. And Grant Hackett revved up to take on Ian Thorpe. 
To sport now and in rugby league, premiership favourites the Bulldogs have suffered a major blow with star lock Travis Norton out for the rest of the season. The 26-year-old has undergone surgery after rupturing a bicep. It's the fourth year in a row he's missed much of the season through injury. The setback comes as the Bulldogs face a big test on Sunday against defending premiers Newcastle. When the Bulldogs secured the signature of Jonathan Thurston, they beat a host of clubs chasing one of league's bright young talents. In a pre-season trial against Brisbane, the 19-year-old scored four tries. Then in June, Thurston made his first grade debut against Penrith. I'm happy, I'm loving life. My girlfriend's moved down from Toowoomba with me, you know. We're going real strong down here, which is good and, you know, works good as well. So, you know, I'm just loving life at the moment. On Sunday, Thurston lines up for just his second game in top grade, while utility back Todd Polglaze is making his debut. Newcastle at home is a mighty challenge. But no one doubts the new kids can handle the rise. It's just another game for those two guys. It's their first game, one, one's first game, one's second game. And you know, if they can just do their job, um, I'm sure they'll enjoy the experience. Even with their injuries, the Bulldogs also boost plenty of firepower. Willie Talau is out with a shoulder problem. But his centre partner, Nigel Vanganar, is at the peak of his career. Vanganar is in again! Obviously it's a team game. And you know, if I wanted to be more individual, I'd probably go play tennis or golf or something like that, you know, so the um, team's going well and that's, that's, what we, you know, that's what we're here for. The Bulldogs are chasing their 16th straight win. Clinton Fletcher for Nightline. In other league news, Canberra's Tyron Smith and Darren Centre from the West Tigers have convinced the judiciary to reduce their suspensions. Smith will now miss four weeks. Centre will be out for one. Also suspended, the Tigers' Trent Runciman. He'll be out for two games. And Mitch Creary from the Northern Eagles. He's out for one. In AFL, Anthony Stevens, the man who succeeded Wayne Carey as skipper of the Kangaroos, plays his 250th game this Sunday and he'll celebrate it playing alongside one of his best mates. The guard on top of his thumb was the only sign Glen Archer had surgery earlier this week to ensure he'll be there for his captain and mate in game 250. So I just want to be there for Steve, eh? Yeah. Needing a tendon repair, the operation was done on Monday, giving him six days to be right for Stephen's big day and return the favour. Stephen's put aside a knee reconstruction and personal problems to play in Archer's 200th match in round one. I can't rate Archie as a friend and as a person highly enough because he's uh, just a champion guy. Stephen's also endorsed Wayne Carey's comeback to football just hours after the AFL admitted it offered Kerry counselling. Wayne's got to get on for his life and um, I think now he's starting to do that um, yeah, and, and you know, good luck to him, I hope he goes well. AFL Chief Executive Wayne Jackson today restated the league's stance on Kerry saying he would be a welcome return to competition ranks next year. But we'd love him uh, back uh, playing our game for the next several years. A few problems at Melbourne, the ship stabilised today with the signing of Neil Danaher to a three year deal. I'm really excited about uh, what what could happen in the next couple of years. At Collingwood, good father and son news for the Cloak family. The Pies signing David's son and Jason's brother, Cameron. And Richmond fans can breathe easy. Rumours of Matthew Richardson's walkout, a product of email fiction. Anthony Mithin for Nightline. Grim signs for other swimmers planning to compete at the Commonwealth Games. Morale is plainly high in the Australian camp. Olympic champion Grant Hackett believes he can break his own world record over 1,500 metres. And he's relishing the prospect of battle with Ian Thorpe in some of the shorter races. Grant Hackett is frustrated. His speed in the pool is fine, but where he really wants to go fast, he can't. Germany's autobahns, with no speed limit, are where he really wants to let loose. His coaches, not surprisingly, say no way. It is absolutely killing me. I would kill to get on the autobahn and go 200 kilometres an hour, but I don't think anyone's going to let me. He did, however, sneak behind the wheel of a stationary Mercedes taxi. But Hackett is more concerned with driving an aggressive Commonwealth Games campaign. Five events, his world record favourite, the 1500, of course, but also the 200 and 400 freestyle two greatly anticipated showdowns with Ian Thorpe. I have no doubt in my mind that I've got seconds up my sleeve in all my events. Hackett says he's more motivated than ever before. For me, I, I feel like now it's, it's more fun. Teammate Matt Welch is also at that same level of maturity. A year ago, almost to the day, he won gold in the 100 metre backstroke at the World Championships, an event Ian Thorpe has decided to contest in Manchester. I think if Australia's biggest problem is which Australia is going to win the backstroke, it's a fantastic place to be. There's no doubt the team has great pride in wearing the green and gold at the Commonwealth Games. 
but it seems in swimming at least the greatest races may be fought between teammate Australia versus Australia in Sindelfingen Germany Michael Usher for Nightline Colombian Santiago Botero has won the 15th and longest stage of the Tour de France. Three-time winner Lance Armstrong finished ninth in the 226km stage, but retains a handy overall lead of nearly four and a half minutes. The cyclists were back in the saddle after a rest day today, but some didn't stay there long. Australian Robbie McEwen lifted himself off the seat to take out the sprint, but Lance Armstrong is expected to shine in tomorrow's 16th stage, the highest and possibly the most gruelling of the tour. Dennis Connor, the legendary American yachtsman who lost the America's Cup to Australia nearly 20 years ago, went one step further today. He lost his yacht. The Stars and Stripes sank underneath him today in 17 metres of water off the Californian coast. It had lost its rudder, leaving a hole in the hull. With preparations for the next America's Cup hotting up, salvage teams plan to raise the $5 million boat within days. Next, tomorrow's weather details, the latest on tonight's top stories, and the girl chosen to star at the opening of the Commonwealth Games. Let's go once more to the Commonwealth Games and the little girl chosen to star in the opening ceremony. While every athlete has a tale of sacrifice in making it to Manchester, she has a special story. It's almost time for Manchester to show the world what it can do. And in the city centre at least, the Commonwealth Games party begins later today. That's when the Queen's Jubilee Baton will arrive in Albert Square. It'll be the end of a journey which began four months and more than 60,000 miles ago. And the battle will be handed to Her Majesty at tomorrow's opening ceremony by a very special guest. Six-year-old Kirsty Howard is terminally ill with a heart condition. In the last few months, she's helped Victoria Beckham open the Harrod sale and walked out at Old Trafford alongside David. But this will be Kirsty's biggest occasion yet. I think it's a fantastic honour uh, for her and, uh, and the highly appropriate that somebody like her should hand the baton over to the Queen. Rumours that David Beckham will accompany Kirsty tomorrow are unconfirmed, but the President of the Commonwealth Games Federation has already arrived in Manchester. Prince Edward was keen to attend a reception for the Scottish team. Actually, the reason was that I, I, I heard that there was a, um, a free drink going, and, and from the Scots, you, you don't ever refuse a free drink from the Scots. So. <laughs> It's unlikely any of the 4,000 athletes in Manchester will be indulging too much for the next 10 days. The national weather and areas of high pressure are affecting eastern Australia as a cold front now moves into the Tasman. Another cold front is moving through the southwest and on into the Bight. The forecasts, fine in Darwin and Brisbane, early showers expected in Sydney, mainly dry in Canberra, fine in Melbourne and Hobart, rain will develop in Adelaide and showers are also expected tomorrow in Perth. Now updating our main stories and another nervous day of trading on the London stock market as the share slump continues to ricochet around the globe. A short while ago the British main share index, the FTSE, had hit a six year low. It follows today's big hit on Australian stock markets. More than 15 billion dollars wiped off the value of shares as we finally succumbed to the woes of Wall Street. The Australian market fell to its lowest level since the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. Democrats leader Natasha Stott Despoy has tried to contain the latest public scrap in her Senate team, intervening from Britain to appeal to her colleagues to cool it. Her deputy, Aidan Ridgway, says the public has had a gutful of the brawling, which today extended to Senator Andrew Murray being called on to consider his future in the party, while another senator described him as gutless and stupid. The radical Palestinian Islamic movement Hamas claims it had been ready to declare a truce before Israel's bomb attack in Gaza, which killed 15 people, including nine children. Israel has apologized for the civilian casualties, but it's still celebrating the main point of the mission, the death of Hamas's military leader. And that was the day. I'm Hugh Rimmington. From all of us here at Nightline, good night. This program was proudly brought to you by Karcher High Pressure Cleaners and Primus Telecom.